good evening again uh, to another one of my fireside chats if you happen to have a fire <laughs> or if not welcome back to another talk on a philosophical topic and this time what I wanted to do was to take a look at something which is very topical at the moment and that's the whole business of vaccination and the, the print not so much the prince medical principles of vaccination and how vaccination operates as a scientific subject. But the whole moral position with regard to vaccination, whether one can or should or could refuse to be vaccinated, on what grounds and on what compulsion can we be made to uh, take on board uh, the jab, as you might say. Now, this applies particularly at the moment because of the nature of uh, we're coming through to the hopefully the very end of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the process of doing that, the world is hopefully trying to get itself into a position where we can be able to speak to each other in face to face again, uh, not have to take as many precautions when we're out and about and cut the number of deaths there are from this particular virus. Uh, now clearly that's an issue, but when it comes to the business of vaccination, and especially in this particular case, there is an enormous amount of pressure on people to take the vaccine, even if they may have doubts about it. And I want to go over the whole business of what uh, the process of vaccination might be with regard to how we look at it from an ethical point of view. Big subject area has been an awful lot written about it. Uh, uh, I, have, you know, can send you quite a bit of material on this subject, but I won't. What I will do is try to talk you through some of the more straightforward principles, which I think will, will clarify the underlying issues. And I think one of the most productive ways to look at this is to look at it in terms of one's freedom or if you want to put it another way, one's liberty, because clearly in the process of taking part in a national health orientated program of this sort, in fact, not even a national health, but a, an international health orientated program of some sort, then one is to a certain extent compelled to take part. If not by law, then at the very least by the social pressure and sense of duty and guilt that one might have about uh, taking on board the jab, uh, you know, irrespective of what kind of jab this is. I'm not going to talk about any particular vaccine vaccine type. Uh, you, that would be something for a, for a scientific discussion, not a philosophical one. So this is really about liberty. This is about one's freedom to choose. And there are good arguments, both pro and con, with regard to how one might approach this. <clears throat> one, of the, the, one of the issues that comes up and I think needs to be recognized is the fact that in the 20th century, the whole business of medicine as a national issue became very much more, more part of the way in which uh, nation states like the UK or you know France or Germany or, or the Amer or USA, how the, those particular nation states thought about the whole business of health became a national issue rather than something that was far more regional, far more local, and far more voluntary in the way in which it operated. This is particularly the case in, in uh, cultures where there is a national health service, because in circumstances like that, in order for a national health service to actually work, one needs to have a certain degree of participation and... <laughs> and a loyalty, maybe that's not the right word, not loyalty, a certain degree of compulsion, I suppose, to take part in it, in order for it to be anything like a national health service at all. That I'll come back to. So in the, in the, in the 20th century, and this was especially in World War II and the aftermath of World War II, health became a national issue. It became a national issue because the science was there to, to, to enable that to happen. We, for instance, had learned an awful lot about the way in which individuals, for instance, can gain uh, genetic 
uh, disabilities of one sort or another. And during the early part of, 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 the, of, of you know, the 1910s, 1900s, there was a, an enthusiasm for the idea of, of medicine doing something about this whole business of, of you know, those genetic issues. And it was about, about that time you suddenly got this interesting uh, idea, interesting because it, 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 it still hangs over us, this idea of eugenics. Eugenics simply means the business of, of doing something about selecting who gets treatment with regard to medicine in order to benefit the majority of the population, and in particular, who is allowed to reproduce, because the argument that was made at the time is was that with some manipulation of, of uh, birth control and sterilization and selective breeding, if you want to put it that way, something could be done into in order to improve the general health, in fact, the general intelligence of the entire human race. And this was a very popular idea. It stemmed from uh, what you might call almost a quasi-racist and quasi-Darwinian, selective Darwinian approach to the whole business of what of what the human race was. And it, it, you can see where the temptation came from, the idea being that for some people who, for all the best intentions, believe this was going to be a really good way of doing something about improving the lot of humanity. However, it didn't turn out like that. Most of us know that during the 1920s, 1930s, and well into the 1940s, some nations across the planet decided that their uh, actions should be used against those individuals within their societies that they thought of as a threat to the general health of others. And there were mass processes of, of compulsory sterilization, which was done in order to, it's, you know, it, it, it's very difficult these days to, to support this in a moral stance, but was thought of at the time as the, for the good of society. And it wasn't just Nazi Germany, Germany either. You got this in Sweden, for instance. You got it in Switzerland. You got it also in the United States, where compulsory sterilization became part and parcel of the business of trying to improve the general health and general welfare of the nation as a whole. The worst areas where this happened was, of course, in Germany in the late 1930s, 1940s, where Hitler's Germany produced a system where you could not only be sterilized, you could also be euthanized for the benefit of the rest of the, of the nation state. Um, Nazi racist policies created this situation and created the situation, for instance, where people with disabilities were seen as a stress upon the economy, a stress upon the nation, and also were handing down their genes to produce even more disabled people. And therefore it was, so the re reasoning went, a blessing that they should be you know the words not rough used for, for, for animals, that they should be put down. This is, of course, from the, from the 21st century point of view, in fact, from, the, from many people at the time, an outrageous suggestion. It's, it's deeply immoral, deeply lacking in any kind of consider, consideration concern. But our feelings about that are really not the issue here. The issue is, what are the moral arguments about this? Where, where are the foundations about the moral arguments? about why the nation state can't intervene in the business of sterilization, euthanasia, and if you want to include it in the whole kit and caboodle of interventions, vaccination as well, because that's another state intervention. I know it sounds an exaggeration, but in principle it is. So what do you do about it? Where is the moral obligation here? Now, after World War II, the shock of Nazi Germany's uh, euthanasia and racist policies, not just disabled people, but homosexuals, people with, people with genetic de defects, Jews, gypsies, blah de blah de blah de blah de blah, were consigned to obliteration from the planet because of the fact they didn't fit in with the policies that were concerned. There was a whole review of the business of what it is to be human, and not only that, what our moral obligations were to each other in the, in the periods after, period after World War II, and more importantly, the medical ethics that went with all of this. Because one of the great shocking things about Germany at the time was how 
doctors had become complicit in the business of these crimes. It wasn't just people like Josef Mengele either. There were others who were involved. Quite a few medical people had been complicit in the business, for instance, for consigning disabled people to gas chambers or to, to, to being uh, euthanized by a lethal injection or something of that sort. So the, this idea threw up a huge challenge to the victors, the, the victorial, uh, victorious allies after the wars, about what it meant to, to be involved in the business of medicine and what med medical ethics should be. In order to come to some sort of understanding of that, there had to be some sort of understanding of what personal liberty meant and also the, the relationship of personal liberty to the rest of the community. Community clearly met, met, made demands on people. It, wasn't, it was impossible not to have a situation. If you lived in a society with other people, they make demands upon you because of the very relationships you have with them. And also, the individual themselves has rights in terms of their freedoms within a community in order to be able to do what they wish, when they wish, as long as, and I think this is pretty logical, you're not harming any, anyone else. So, famous uh, philosophers after World War II were very much involved in all this. And one particular individual I think needs mentioning, that was Isaiah Berlin. In the period after the war, he wrote a, a very interesting piece of work in which he talked about what liberty meant in the most objective sense of the word. He talked about it as being comprising of two elements really, freedom from and freedom to. The freedom to do things is what most people consider to be the, the, uh, the, the liberty mostly they think about. Freedom to do stuff is like, you know, the freedom I've got to uh, walk out the door, walk down the street, go where I wish, drive my car you know, as I see fit, journey around the nation, or, uh, and so on and so forth. Freedom from is more difficult to understand, but it's about being free from the persecution and uh, imposition that other people would make upon you. So, freedom from, in the context of what happened during the war, would have been freedom from the right of the state to say, we're going to sterilize you because you don't fit in with the kind of structures of society we think there should be in place. You, are not, you should not be allowed to have children because as we say so. That the concept of freedom from is an attempt to prevent that happening. Freedom from was seen as something really important in order to ensure the state didn't interfere in someone's life, life and persecute them and make them uh, 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 you know, subject to unfair medical and other interventions which at the end of the day would infringe their rights as an, ind as an individual. It was very, I mean, you know, that difficult to understand. Freedom from and freedom to are like, as pe many people have said, are like two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. Uh, it's often forgotten. In fact, it's very often forgotten these days when talking about what your freedom is, what your liberty is, that in order to be freedom to do things, you also need freedom from the impositions of others. And then those, that vice versa is also true. In order to be freedom, have the freedom from others, you have to be living in a society in which there is a certain sort of negotiation about what your freedoms are and what you're free to do in those sorts of circumstances. I'll give you an example. As I used, the example I used earlier on was I'm free to drive my car under normal circumstances as I see fit. I can go where I want in my car. But I'm not allowed to drive on the right hand side of the road in the UK. I follow the restriction of driving on the left, which is characteristic of, uh, of the United Kingdom, strange though it may be. And in the process of doing that, you see that I've got freedom to drive where I want. But in order to make sure that I can cooperate with other drivers who also have to drive where they want, I have to sustain a certain degree of constriction and contraction of my freedom in order to do that. And, and that means driving on the side of the road that's obligate, that the obligation of law imposes upon me. That's a good example of how freedom from and freedom to work. I'm free to go where I want, but I'm not free to do everything I want. And you could apply that same principle to almost everything within any kind of society where you are in contact with other people on a regular basis. 
may be different, I suppose, if you're living totally isolated away from absolutely everybody you can think of. But, truth of the matter is, this is all about the business of living in a society of some sort, some sort or other. Written into the business of freedom from and freedom to, therefore, there is something called bodily autonomy. Bodily autonomy means that this body that I have, I mean, the word I have is not really right, but it's the one we use. This body that I am is mine to order and use as I see fit. I am allowed to make use of it as I see fit, the same way as I use my car, uh, without the interventions and without the restrictions of other people telling me how I'm supposed to do that. That bodily autonomy concept is an extraordinarily powerful issue within 20, 21st century society because it applies to transgender people. It applies in terms of the way in which they the surgery they can take that they can they can uh, you know use with their foot with their body too in order to have the kind of genitals and the kind of body they want. And at the same time, it also applies to women in terms of, for instance, the the. Uh, about with a, well, a woman should be able to have a baby or refuse to have a baby, and and you know the contro controversy over the whole business of abortion that comes from that. The state, because of bodily autonomy, can't simply just intervene and say, right, we're going to come, we're going to make you have children because we believe that this is the way in which this, this should work. And there, uh, I, and I strongly support that idea that you know that. Bodily autonomy should play a huge part in individuals' lives in any kind of society that pretends that is democratic. I've just said something that's quite controversial because if you look across the world, very often you find there are societies that don't believe that at all. But let's not go there. Let's talk then about the whole business of how health systems work in, with regard to the business of that concept of bodily autonomy. Bodily autonomy is a, a whole idea, it, you know, it has a major fundamental uh, a foundational place in the way one thinks about the business of one's life and the way in one, one lives. So, for example, somebody may say to me, uh, uh, there are flu epidemics every year, I'm not talking about COVID-19, flu epidemics every year, you should have a flu vaccination every year in November, and they might make the argument, for instance, that it's uh, uh, it would stop the spread of flu within society, make it less of an imposition upon doctors and in, in the NHS, because you're less likely to get the flu if you have the vaccine. But there's no compulsion to do it. The compulsion is based upon the idea of me accepting a moral argument which says that I should do it why? Because of the, as I've said, the whole business of how that impacts upon myself and other people within society. And that there is a kind of collective responsibility of me towards the rest of the society because I am part of it. So, uh, from the argument that's made about taking on board a flu vaccine is, in, a, in essence, if I get the vaccination, what I'm doing is benefiting society and because I'm part of the society, benefiting myself. But there cannot be any compulsion, because if there was compulsion, it would be infringing my right to bodily autonomy. In other words, the, <laughs> the government can't send the police down here, wrestle me from my home, take me down to the doctors, and pin me down while they force the flu vaccine into my arm. Can't do that. Nazi Germany could do that, possibly. Okay, And also other nations have been doing other similar things. Please do look it up, look up uh, uh, issues around uh, 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 you know compulsory medicine around the world. You will see it's not been uncommon. So what we have here is an interesting quandary with regard to the pandemic, because the same principle applies. Just because we're in the middle of an emergency doesn't mean to say that the moral issues drift out the window. We don't have to think about them anymore. In fact, we have to think about them even more clear, clearly now than we did previously. It is right, in principle that a person volunteers to have a COVID-19 vaccination, that they volunteer to have it. If the government said, you must have it or we'll sling you in jail, I would be the first person to object. 
because of the argument of bodily autonomy, which I think is pretty sound. However, there are other issues here. As I was saying earlier on, the whole business of, of having a vaccination program in the first place is not simply to protect other people, it's to protect me too. Therefore, it is in my interest, if I consider it that way, to take on board a vaccination because I will therefore have less chance of catching a disease from, you know, the COVID-19 virus and suffering badly from it from other people within society. Now, if I generalize that point, if I generalize that point to everyone else, then clearly it's in everyone else's benefit also to have a vaccination because it means they're not likely to get COVID-19 from me by accident if I happen to be in accidental contact with them within, you know, in Aldea, wherever I happen to be, uh, because of that. So there is a general sense of the public good is related to self-interest, not just the business of it being something to do with the rest of society. I'm, the argument that I'm making, and I think it's a pretty sound one, is by taking on board a vaccine, what I'm in fact doing is creating a situation where I'm protecting myself and other people at the same time. So there is a general good to be had from this. However, the issue always is, and I think always has, should be, the business of voluntarily. I don't think it's right for this to be done on a compulsory basis. And I've already made that argument so far. So what, if, you, if I was to try to summarize this particular ethical argument, uh, uh, based upon the ideas of freedom from and freedom to, I have the, I have the right under the freedom from concept to say my bodily autonomy is my own and I have freedom from you treating me against my will with medical systems that I object to. Okay, makes sense. I have the freedom to go about society, but I don't have the freedom to inflict my virus-filled <laughs> spittle <laughs> and exhalations on other people. That would be an infringement of their freedom from. Therefore, there has to be some sort of balance within all this. Clearly, that, clearly that balance, what I've just, just said from the Berlin principle uh, uh, you know, of, the, of the dual types of, of, of liberty, the two, two kinds of liberty, positive and negative liberty, it seems pretty much clear that there is some sort of uh, concession that needs to be made between my right to do as I want and other people not to suffer from it. And that right is based upon a voluntary understanding of what the moral issues are. The moral issues are not explained to me, and I may make the wrong decision. And I think one of the biggest issues that we've got in when people object on in principle to, to, having, to not having COVID-19 vaccination is because they do it on the basis that they think their, their bodily autonomy has been infringed. I don't think so. I think as long as it's a voluntary effort and as long as they go along with the argument, I think the argument is pretty clear and one should be vaccinated. And I think those sorts of issues are, uh, you know, if you look at it from the point of view of Berlin and if you look at it from the point of view of history, make a certain degree of sense. So what is the result of all this? What is the result of talking about vaccination? The result is that vaccination as, a, as, a, as an idea is in principle, in my interests, a very good uh, protection for myself. It's, it's, um, it's in my interests to, uh, to make use of it. If we think about that in the generalized sense, so if we apply that same principle to everybody else, then by everybody saying it's in my interest to take part, we gain a situation where everybody feels that they are contributing to the general good of society. And of course, hopefully, we end up being healthier because of that. And uh, ironically speaking, we also, in the current situation, we stole some of the freedoms that we've lost, which were curtailed because of the nature of the pandemic. You know, by being socially distanced, by being locked down, by being unable to touch other human beings. And I think that, you know, that, that, that has a clear advantage there. But there is always one, I'm repeating myself again, but I, I think it's really important. There is always one caveat, and that caveat is the voluntary nature of all of this. 
I hope that was interesting. I, 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 it, it, I've been thinking about this quite a lot. I was sort of lying awake in bed last night at five in the morning thinking about how I would try to explain this. And it's, uh, it is easy enough to explain. It's just there are so many ins and outs of how this applies. I hope if you get a chance to think it through, you might find this interesting in terms of how you explain the vaccination issue to those who are reluctant. Because I, I think it's... Uh, you know, in the current circumstances, it's probably a very, almost, almost a dutiful thing to how to explain to others exactly what the moral judgments are with regard to that. And if you have, and if you've understood it, or at the very least, it's prodded you to start thinking about it, then that's great. Thank you so much for listening. I enjoyed speaking to you as ever, and uh, have a good week. Thank you now. Bye bye.